gluten, irritable bowel syndrome, do they have any connection? What is celiac? What is gluten? Irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome, the very name indicates what it is, which is irritation of the gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal tract is a very interesting part of our body. And to understand what celiac is, to understand what the relation gluten has to it and irritable bowel syndrome, I want to begin this presentation by taking you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. It is a hollow tube. It is approximately eight meters long. It is an external structure, external structure meaning anything that goes in there is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances, then absorbed through the wall and into the blood, then it becomes part of you. The blood is often called the river of life. The Bible calls it the life of the flesh because the blood is the carrier. It's the carrier of nutrients all through the body. To the CBD, central business district of the human body, is the workings inside the cell. So let's have a look at the gastrointestinal tract. Let me define what I mean, first of all, by an external structure. This little coat that I have on now is not part of me, even though it is touching my skin. It will only become part of me if somehow it breaks down to tiny substances, gets absorbed through my pores into my blood, then it is part of me. And so the food that we eat, when it goes into our bodies, it does not become part of us until it gets broken down to tiny little substances absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you or me. So let's begin the mouth. Do you know that's the only part of our gastrointestinal tract that we have say over? And we have say over what goes in. We have say over how long it's in there. We have say over how often it goes in there. So we have say over what goes in. We choose the food that goes into our bodies. And the food that, are, that goes into our body has a direct relation on whether we have or we don't have celiac or whether we have or don't have irritable bowel syndrome. Gluten is one of those foods. I will be defining that later. In our mouth are teeth and teeth chew up that food. I said we have say over what goes in, we have say over how long it is in there, meaning it should be in our mouth till that food is broken down almost to liquid. We've got a problem today. We've got a very fast society. People eat fast. People do everything fast. My husband eats fast. I'm always saying, slow down. <laughs> Sometimes I touch his lips and smile a little slower, a little slower. You see, there are no teeth in the stomach. And so it's very important that the food stay in our mouth and we chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it until we can just about drink it. You've probably heard the old saying, we should chew our drinks and drink our food. It's actually referring to, and I do mention this to our guests at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, when they take their juices, take a mouthful and swish it round in the mouth or chew it, then swallow it. That allows time for the digestive enzymes to work in and around or through those little particles of juice and then swallow it. And what do I mean by drink our food? We should chew it until it's just about a liquid and then swallow it down. Oh, that makes the stomach very happy. It makes all the other functions of the gastrointestinal tract so much easier when we chew it. And that's why often in families you can have a little bit of a competition to see who can chew the most, even to put the knife and fork down between the meals because children, especially when they're hungry and they love the food, they can, they can be eating a little bit too fast. So we have say over what goes in, we have say over how long it is in the mouth. When we chew our food and break it down to tiny particles, it actually means there's a larger surface area for the enzymes to work on. Now the mouth is an alkaline environment. And the enzymes in the mouth are the ones that only work in an alkaline environment. And the main enzyme released in the mouth for digestion 
is an amylase called tylen. And tylen is the enzyme that breaks down starch. That's the only food or the main food that starts digestion in the mouth. You see, the stomach is an acid environment. And so as soon as the tylen and the starch reach the, reach the stomach, digestion starts to slow down of starch because it is now in an acid environment. There is one more food that does start its breakdown in the mouth, and that is saturated fats like coconut. It's a short or a medium chain fatty acid, and there are glands just underneath the tongue called sublingual glands, and they release lingual lipase. And lingual lipase is the enzyme that breaks down short and medium chain fatty acids. So we'll, we'll say, for short, saturated fat. That's the only breakdown that happens in the mouth. Now the stomach is an acid environment. When the short chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids in the saturated fats, specifically I'm referring to coconut, when it comes into the stomach, the breakdown's already happened, so it just happily goes along with what's happening there. The uh, starch digestion, which is all your starch foods are things like pasta, things like breads, potatoes, cereals, cakes, biscuits. When they get to the stomach, because it is an acid environment, that digestion is slowed down. It is in the stomach that two enzymes are released, hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen both unite together to release pepsin. And pepsin is what's, is what's often called an a enzyme, a proteolytic enzyme. And a proteolytic enzyme is what breaks down protein. That is the only digestion that happens in the stomach. Most people are unaware of that. And that's the only part of the stomach that is acid. In fact, these two coming together can only happen in an acid environment. Pepsin can only work in an acid environment. That's why it is so important not to drink with our meals because that waters down that acid environment. We should be drinking half an hour before the meal and resume about an hour and a half, two hours after the meal. If you're thirsty, have a mouthful. One mouthful is not going to drastically change that acid environment. But the majority of our water should be drunk between meals. Protein is broken down in the stomach in a very acid environment. At the end of the stomach, there's a little gate called pyloric sphincter. And the pyloric sphincter, when we wake up in the morning, it is open. That's why the best thing to do in the morning is drink a glass of water and the water will be a little bit absorbed here, but it'll come down here and it's a lovely stimulant for starting the action of the, of the intestines, the large and the small. But when you smell food, when your brain knows breakfast is coming, then pyloric sphincter shuts. All of these enzymes here are started to be released to create the proteolytic enzyme, which breaks down the protein. So everything is ready because the main function of this incredibly complex external structure is to break our food down right to the right state so it can go into our blood and then travel all through our body to the cell, which is why we see, why we hear, why our heart beats, why our whole body moves, why our brain thinks. So this whole system is designed just to get those tiny structures to feed every cell. 
As the protein gets broken down, pyloric sphincter begins to open little by little by little. Digestion in the stomach takes approximately three to four hours. By the time four hours is up, usually the stomach is empty. And then the body loves a rest, specifically the stomach loves a rest of one hour. In that one hour rest, it allows all the digestive enzymes to be replaced. The lining of the gut basically looks like this. The lining of the stomach looks like this. And there are glands all surrounding those big folds. Two thirds of those glands, the top two thirds, release mucus. And that mucus is important to protect the lining of the stomach from this proteolytic enzyme pepsin, which could start to break down our stomach wall. So we've got this thick mucosa lining. Down here, these digestive glands here, they are ones that are releasing the hydrochloric acid, the pepsinogen. They also release the intrinsic factor, which is required way down here at the bottom part of the small intestine for the absorption of vitamin B. So the proper handling of the stomach is vital so that all of these enzymes are replaced as they need to be replaced. If someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, how do you know? They say to me, I can feel it. That that doesn't mean you've got too much acid. That means your lining of the stomach is too thin and little holes can start to be eaten into that lining. Why would it be too thin? Well, mucus is 99% water. The main cause of too thin a lining in the stomach is dehydration. <laughs> it's as simple as that. A glass of water half an hour before we eat will immediately thicken that mucosa wall. That's why it's a good time. Gather the family together, even three quarters of an hour before the meal. Let's drink. <laughs> so very important that the water be drunk. Very important that there be a gap between meals. And the only way you can have that gap between meals, and we have looked at this in our previous lectures, is to eat a food program that is very high in fiber, that has great amounts of vegetarian protein, and that has some healthy fats. I call them the FPFs. As the food gets broken down, pyloric sphincter opens, and little by little it comes through to the duodenum. This is the duodenum here. It's the first part of the small intestine. Duodenum is an alkaline environment. As an alkaline environment, then the rest of starch can start to happen. So when it comes into this alkaline environment, a few things are happening here. Here is the liver, there's our gallbladder, this is the bile duct. Can you see it comes down and it connects with the neck of the pancreas? This is pancreas here. What happens in the duodenum is bile from the gallbladder starts to break the fat down into tiny particles. So we've got fat and it's broken down with the bile. So that comes from your liver. One lady said, what if you don't have a gallbladder? It is the liver that makes the bile and the gallbladder really is just a reservoir for the bile. So if the bile, if the bile hasn't got its reservoir anymore, then it really will just be made in the liver and then just put straight down. The body is an amazing organism in its ability to adapt, quite phenomenal. So the bile from the liver starts to break down the fat here in the duodenum. Something else comes on now, and that is some enzymes from the pancreas. So the pancreas releases quite a few. So from the pancreas, 
We'll come over here because we've got quite a few. And this one might surprise you, sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarb is released from the pancreas to neutralize the stomach acid as it comes out because the duodenum is an alkaline environment. So the sodium bicarbonate is released from the pancreas. That's not right, is it? I thought we had a problem there. That's better. <laughs> from the pancreas to neutralize the stomach acid as it comes through and to maintain or ensure that the duodenum is an alkaline environment. And then from the pancreas, we've got pancreatic lipase. We'll just put a P for pancreatic lipase. And the pancreatic lipase further breaks down the fat. We've also got pancreatic amylase. And amylase is the enzyme that breaks down starch. So can you see starch digestion is happening or begun in the mouth. It's put on hold in the stomach in that acid environment and then it's revived again in the duodenum under the action of pancreatic amylase. That's where the final breakdown happens. The pancreas also releases trypsin. And trypsin and chymotrypsin are two proteolytic enzymes. And remember, the proteolytic enzymes are the ones that break down protein. Most people don't realize what an important role that the pancreas plays in digestion. The pancreas, when you look at this, is really the main organ of digestion. But the pancreas is going to have a tough job if the stomach doesn't do its work. The pancreas is going to have a tough job if the mouth has been unable to do its work. Can you see that? So one of the best things you can do for your pancreas is to make sure you chew your food well, make sure you don't drink with your meals, make sure you have a food program with good amounts of fiber, great proteins and fats, and don't drink with your meal. And that will make the life for the pancreas much easier, much easier. So let's just go over what pancreas does again. In fact, have a look at this. Number one, sodium bicarb. Number two, pancreatic lipase. Number three, pancreatic amylase. Number four, trypsin. And number five, chymotrypsin. Sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid. Pancreatic lipase to finalize the fat. Pancreatic amylase to help finalize the starch trypsin and chymotrypsin to finalize that protein breakdown. So as you can see, by the time you're getting down into the probably second part of your small intestine, the majority of your digestion has happened. And then in this small intestine, and it's quite a few meters long, it is here we get the villi. These villi are lining this small intestine. And it's across the villi that you have the capillary network. And remember, anything that goes into that gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to these tiny substances. With the fat, it's glycerol and fatty acids. And the glycerol and fatty acids, they don't go into the blood. The glycerol and fatty acids go straight into the lacteal, which is part of your lymphatic system. But as I defined earlier in the week when we looked at fats, the uh, short chain fatty acids that you find in saturated fats like coconut oil, 
because their breakdown starts in the mouth, they don't need the bile and they don't need the pancreatic lipase. So your bile and your pancreatic lipase are the ones that are working on the long chain fatty acids. And it's the long chain fatty acids that come into the lacteal. But the unique thing about coconut oil is the breakdown happens in the mouth. Well, it begins in the mouth and it continues all the way down the tract and then it gets taken into the blood. The long chain fatty acids, that doesn't happen to. So now we're at the point in the gastrointestinal tract where we've come to the area where it's the final finale, really, of digestion, which is coming through the brush border wall and into the blood, or as with the long chain fatty acids, into the lacteal. Now, you'll notice that I have drawn a thick layer, and I've drawn it in green because it is like a jungle <laughs> or a turf. One writer called it a jungle, another one called it a turf, and that Thick turf is made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bifidus bacterium. Lactobacillus and, Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bifidus bacterium, some people say, can you speak English please? That's the name of our healthy or friendly bacteria and they are the two permanent one and all the others, you've probably read of many others, they actually are made from those two permanent ones. They line this gastrointestinal tract and they are responsible for three main functions. One is breakdown. They are responsible for the final touch, so to speak, the final touch of breakdown. They are responsible for the absorption, the absorption through and into the blood, but they are also responsible for protection. There's your border protection. Pretty important, aren't they? Every part of this gastrointestinal tract is vital. But I would have to say this is probably the most vital part because this is the grand finale. This is now, finally, we're ready to go through, to go through the gates of the city and into the blood, the river of life that will now, this is the main function of the reason we eat. People don't know that. People think we eat because it tastes good. No, 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 we eat to get nutrients, to get through to that blood to go the, to the CBD. Remember, central business district of the body is the inside of the cell. But something's happening today which is causing a breakdown of your border protection. Let me explain. When we are in utero, we have no border protection. Babies have a sterile gut, so to speak. There is no border protection over it. And when they're born, they come through the birth canal. They are literally showered with the mother's microorganisms. One one professor I was listening to, he said, I always thought God made a mistake to put the anus and the vagina so close together. He said, because what's coming out of the anus, you don't want anywhere near that baby. But he said, now we are discovering that it was no accident or mistake. It was carefully designed because when that birth canal stretches open, and the head comes out, I gave birth to a, a 10 pound baby. <laughs> They're big. When that birth canal stretches out, the anal sphincter also stretches and microorganisms literally shower that baby in birth. And that's very important because those microorganisms that shower the baby are responsible for building up in that baby's gut this important, essential gut flora, a board of protection. And when the baby receives the colostrum, that thick, thick milk in those first few days, you couldn't even call it milk, it would have to be cream. 
that also has microorganisms that help to line this gut. You've probably read of that colostrum, that that's an important part on the body's, on the baby's immune system in building up that proper gut flora. Because did you know that our immune system is established in our gut? The gut's a very important part of the body. Not often discussed, actually rarely discussed, <laughs> Until you come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat, people say, I'm talking about things I never talked about. What happens if a baby's born via caesarean section? Do you know they're showing now that babies born via caesarean section, their gut starts to build up with skin flora, not gut flora. And skin flora is fantastic for skin, but it actually doesn't work properly in the gut. And what if the baby's not breastfed? And what if the nurse walks past the baby with a sniffle? That baby catches it like that. Mothers should be told if they give birth to via caesarean section, they should paint the nipple every morning with a little probiotic. Probi probiotic means for life. It's lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium powder, just a little on the nipple. And if the mother cannot breastfeed, then the best milk really is goat's milk because the size of a goat, very similar to the size of a human. <laughs> you look at a cow, they're as big as their mother within one year. And cows aren't very intelligent and they get very big and fat. So if you want a baby that's not very intelligent and gets big and fat early, give the baby cow's milk. Cow's milk's perfect milk for baby calves, full stop. That's about it. I can't think of any other reason. What happens if the mother has a compromised gut flora? Then the baby will be born with a compromised gut flora. The breast milk would contain compromised flora to give to that baby. What would compromise that gut flora? Antibiotics wipe out the gut flora. It was only two nights ago it had on the news. In fact, there was a section on the 7.30 report about this little boy who, who had nearly died. He was just given antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic for, for ear problems. But as I'll show you later, what we have to look at is why are the ear problems there? And there are certain foods that can create that. They nearly lost that little boy. That little boy at the age of seven had literally become immune to antibiotics. Did you know that Australia has the highest user of antibiotics in the world today? That's what it said on the 7.30 report. Doctors have been asked to please reduce, please reduce the antibiotics. We're going to go back to the old ways. Instead, when we get a cold, instead of going to the doctor for an antibiotic, even if we're coughing up yellow, we should have lemon and honey drinks. We should put our feet in hot water. We should go to bed for a day. We should exercise. We should eat lightly, if at all. We should have some hot and cold showers, go to the gym, have a steam bath, go into the cold. These are all the old remedies that boost your immune system. The body can heal itself. Most people don't wait long enough or they're not actually giving the body the right conditions so that it can heal. Antibiotics. I'm not against antibiotics. The human gut can cope with about two courses in a lifetime. Did you hear that? About two courses in a lifetime. It's the overuse. Contraceptive pill. There are alternatives to the contraceptive pill. Statin drugs. In another of my lecture, I showed you that cholesterol is not the problem and we need to be cautious not to get cholesterol too low. Many drugs kill off the gut flora. And then as the gut flora is being killed off, the person has a high sugar diet, or having alcohol every night. And as I look in, the minute, in a minute, the high sugar starch in wheat feeding the, uh, the yeasts in the gut so that they get out of control. Now this gut flora plays another role other than breakdown, absorption and protection. They also play a role of nourishment. Who do they nourish? They nourish the cells that line this gastrointestinal tract. 
and they're remade every three to five days. So the so the, the cell is born down here in the valley. It takes three to five days for that cell to move up and then it's taken away. We'll put wings on it. Flies away to the graveyard. It's dead now. Those cells, as they move up, are nourished by this gut flora. So when there is no gut flora, the cells are not nourished and they are unable to play their role. So what happened is the final breakdown isn't able to happen properly. Absorption isn't happening properly. Protection against harmful microbes isn't happening and the nourishment of those walls isn't happening. And this is one of the reasons why people with irritable bowel aren't healing because they should heal in about two weeks. When you consider that these cells are remade every three to five days. Do you know the problem might have started here, the problem might partially be here, the problem might partially be in the liver, it might partially be in the pancreas. There's a whole lot of things that if they're not working properly, can affect this. But I think myself, one of the major problems is lack of proper gut flora. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a list. I'm going to show you what one can do to conquer celiac and conquer irritable bowel. I could actually put a few th more things in there to conquer sinus problems, to conquer asthma problems, to conquer bronchitis, to conquer earaches, to conquer eczema, to conquer psoriasis, to conquer Crohn's disease, to conquer colitis, to conquer irritable bowel. There's one remedy. Number one, eliminate. And as he says in his book, the author claims in the book Grain Brain of Kids with autism getting 50% recovery by just stopping the wheat and the dairy. And it's very important to also stop refined sugar because that sugar just feeds the harmful microbes, feeds the yeast in the gut. These much stop. A lady rang the other day with a one-year-old with eczema. I said to her, does the baby eat? She said, yes. I said the baby should have no starch till the baby has teeth. You see the tylen in the mouth, remember I talked about tylen in the mouth breaking down starch? There's not there. It's not released until the molars are through. That's about 18 months of age. Baby should have no starch. What does baby eat? Milk and a little bit of vegetable and a little bit of fruit. That's when the little tastes happen. She said, well, I've mostly stopped. She said, what, will, what milk will I give the baby? I said, is the baby breastfed? She said, yes. I said, well, there's no need for any other milk. But I said, do you eat wheat, dairy or sugar? She said, oh, a little bit. I said, you've got to stop it completely. She said, that's very hard. I said, well, it's either stopping that or have the eczema. I said, it's not forever. It's just for a period of time. It's not forever, it's just for a period of time. But this gut will not heal Why these are touching it. Do you see that? You have to stop. If you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. They must be eliminated. There are so many other grains. You've got rice, you've got millet, you've got quinoa, you've got buckwheat, amaranth. There are so many grains. There's no need to have the wheat. Well, how can we not have dairy? People say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned. I don't drink milk. Milk's for babies. Okay. Mind you, we use a bit of coconut cream. What sugar do you use? I don't use much sugar. But if I do cook my husband an apple strudel, I use the spelt flour, I use maple syrup, I use grated apple. You can make delicious foods. They must be eliminated. Number two, probiotic. 
a probiotic for life. You can buy probiotic powders that contain Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium that would be taken three quarters of an hour before you eat and they will come down while that pyloric sphincter is open. They will come down and they will start to repopulate the bottom part of your gut. Number three, there are two herbs that coat, soothe and heal that gut. One is aloe vera and the other one is slippery elm. Slippery elm it is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. They're both a bit gooey, aren't they? <laughs> and they should be gooey because we need some nice goo to line this gut. Remember in Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says God gave herbs for the service of man. That's what they do. They come in and serve you. Not necessary to take both of them at once. You might do a week on this one and a week on that one. For someone who is severe, I suggest but before every meal and just before bed. You can peel the aloe vera plant, mash it up or chew it up and swallow it. Or you can buy the slippery on powder, put a teaspoon in about a half a cup of warm water, mix it well, drink it immediately, because if you don't, it'll get very thick and you'll be eating it with a spoon. One of our guests said, I prefer to eat it with a spoon. I'll leave it up to you. Number four. Water between. No water with meals, water between approximately two to two and a half liters every day. Number five, breakfast like a king. Lunch like a queen. And tea like a pauper. When your body goes to bed, your gut wants to sleep. And if you go to bed with a full stomach, your gut cannot sleep. If it does go to sleep, you'll die of tamain poisoning because all the food will rot. <laughs> Tea like a pauper. And sometimes paupers don't eat. You don't fuel your car up at the end of the journey. You fuel it up at the beginning of the journey. Number six, very important to exercise. Exercise, and this will get stronger as you use it. It's called self-control. Got that? <laughs> and exercise the body. Very important that the body move every day. Exercise gently massages all these internal organs. Exercise increases the blood supply to all these internal organs. And very important to experience peace. In a highly stressed environment, it affects your digestion. It affects your liver. It affects your pancreas. It affects your whole gut. <laughs>